Hey there, hey, welcome back to Firm Foundation. My name is Kay and today we're gonna be reading James chapter five. Let's pray first. Father God, we just come to you today in Thanksgiving. Lord, we ask that today you drop wisdom into our spirits. Lord, help us to know how to read your word, receive your word, and then act in our faith. Lord, help us to remain in obedience and submit our ways to you. God, you know the plan that you have for us. It's a perfect plan. And we just ask that you help us to submit to your will, to not get caught up in the, our fleshly desires or the desires of the world, but instead to keep our eyes trained and focused on you. Help us to train up our children children. Help us to be an example and a light to those around us. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Y'all, I'd be liking to keep my prayers like short and snappy because I don't know, sometimes you just get going and it's like, what am I even talking about here? Anyway, quick disclaimer, I am a little bit rushed because my toddlers are sleeping and honestly, I couldn't even like get dressed. So I actually recorded, I'm recording this right after I recorded four and I am wearing like the same dress. <laughs> I'm wearing the same dress from earlier so just for my moms out there that are like i don't have time to do things i get it i'm right there with you it's never perfect and we just let it be what it's going to be all right james chapter five so I, inside my Bible, the little heading for it, it says warning to the rich. And one thing that I wanted to note before I started reading this is that in this particular section right here as a warning to the rich, one thing that I noticed and looked up and as I was reading, I was kind of like thinking about this concept of when James is writing this piece, he's talking to the rich people who are playing church, right? Quote unquote, they're playing church. So essentially there are rich people or people that have status, people that have means, or maybe even those people in chapter two that um, are showing favor right towards the rich he's speaking to these people and he's like you know you're playing church right one on one end you are rich and you are um, you know showing up to church but really deep down inside you're exploiting people right like you're exploiting people and he's just saying judgment is coming for this person so that is like the context a little bit of the context behind what's happening here verse one come now you rich weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you like i said he's essentially telling them judgment is coming right verse two your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten gross your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire you have laid up treasure in the last days behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you have kept back by fraud are crying out against you and the cries of the har harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Woo. Okay. It's giving James is not holding back on the rich, right? He is not holding back on people who are storing up their riches here on earth. And he's basically saying, these people are living independent of God, right? And they're living dependent on your on their riches. And I talked about this in chapter four as well, where sometimes when you have too much, you start to rely on what you have and not rely on God. And James is like, mm, it's all going to tell on you. Like all the riches that you stored, all the people that you didn't treat well, you know, you had people working for you, you weren't paying them. You had all this gold and this money and this wealth, and you were just holding it and storing it up for yourself. You weren't doing good with it. The people that you have hurt and harmed, they are crying out to God and God heard them. God hears them and you will be judged for it. So this is a warning. This is a huge warning to us as believers because it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank or how much money you don't have. In some way, you are rich. How are you storing up your treasures, right? Are you storing up your treasures and relying on yourself or are you doing right? Are you doing right by God's people? Are you doing right by the church? Are you doing right by people in general, right? Remember that royal law that James has been talking about is Jesus telling us to love our neighbor as ourselves, right? And that's the reminder that James has given us throughout this entire book is that Jesus said that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. So are you loving your neighbor when you store up treasures for yourself, when you don't give to those in need right when you don't serve other people when you see that there was a need and you don't meet it right is that you loving your neighbor no it's not and it's going to tell on you right it's going to tell on you when it's time for judgment and i do want to keep it in context in this in this context james is talking about people that have wealth right these christians that have the resources they have the means and they're just playing church they're just acting like this servant of god this servant of jesus but really their life is not showing that they're really storing up treasures for themselves and they're relying on what they have and not on god verse seven be be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Amen. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I love this because James is basically like giving us a great example of 
patience, right? Be patient in the season that you are in. Just like when, when a farmer or a gardener plants something, they don't harvest immediately, right? They're, it takes some time. They have to be patient. They have to wait for whatever they planted to mature, to grow. And James is essentially telling us, be patient in the season that you're in, right? You might be in a season where you are sowing seeds right now, right? Where you're putting seeds into the ground, whatever that looks like, be patient because at a time, those seeds will mature. You will get your reward, whether it's here on earth or in heaven. But I love how here he's really pressing us to focus on our heavenly reward because he says, you also be patient, establish your hearts, right? Establish, that means to get our hearts right, to focus in on our hearts. So be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand, right? So that means this is our earthly reward. Like that's way better than any reward we could receive here on earth. Verse nine, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example, of suffering and patience. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we considered those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard the steadfastness or the perseverance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And I love this part here because when I first read it, it was a little bit confusing. I had to read this like three times in order for it to really sink in what he was trying to say here. But James is saying, and I talked about this, I think maybe in chapter one or chapter two, but James is talking about how the fact or the fact that God allowed those things to happen for his good, right? God ended up blessing Job immeasurably, even though he was being tempted and tested by the devil. So while God gave Satan some authority, Satan was also limited in what he could actually do to Job. There were there were two different instances where God said to him, you can, you can touch the servant, but here's the extent of what you can do. And that is his compassion. That is his mercy. And then at the end, Job is blessed immeasurably. I think he was like double, he got double blessings at the end of all that. And so I love this example because James is talking about perseverance. He's talking about us enduring our trials, right? Remember at the beginning, count it all joy, right? He's telling us to count it all joy because we are going to experience trials. But here he's reminding us to be patient in our suffering, to be patient and wait on the Lord because God is going to bless us and he's going to bless us immeasurably. He is coming. So then James goes on to say in verse 12, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. And I just love this. And I, I feel like I say this verse so much to people, especially whenever they ask me a question, I just say yes, no, I don't give any extra. I'm always thinking to myself, like, I have to honor my word, right? Like, I'm, I'm going to speak with integrity. It's it's either a yes or a no. There's no, I swear by, you know, this, or I swear on my mom. Like, you know, people have all kinds of swears and oaths and promises that you make. And I know like in our current culture, it's, you know, almost expected or, you know, it's not that big of a deal, but it really is. And James is just telling us here, like, hey, your yes and your no is enough. So I love that as a short little James proverb drop for us. Verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. I want to pause right here and say that one thing that really stuck out to me when I was reading th these two verses is who James is speaking directly to. When he says, is someone suffering? He says, let him pray right? Let that person, like you should pray for your own self, right? It's important to do that. So let him pray. If you're cheerful, you should be the one that's singing, right? You should be the one singing praise. But I love the next step that he tells us, right? If anyone is among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church, right? You should go and seek people to also pray for you. But I do love that James is very intentional in saying that if you're suffering, you need to pray. If you are joyful, you need to praise God, right? Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other that you may be healed Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And I love this because essentially James is just saying prayer is going to lead to healing and it's going to lead to forgiveness. And, you know, I want to be clear and say, I don't think that James is saying like, if you're sick, you're going to automatically be healed because sometimes our healing is not happening here on earth, right? Our physical body might not be healed, but we will receive forgiveness, right? We will, as if you're, if you are being righteous, if you are right with God, you will experience that forgiveness, right? That is a result of your prayer. That prayer will be answered in that way. And even if your body is not physically healed here on earth, God has something so much greater for you in heaven. 
7. Verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. A great example of prayer being answered and what God does and how God responds to the prayers of the righteous. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Restoration is available. Amen. I'm so grateful for this. Restoration is available to those who come back. So we can wander, right? We can wander from our faith. We can wander from the truth, but we can come back, right? Restoration is available to us. And that is good news. That is such great news because we won't be perfect. We can't be perfect, right? I cannot do everything the right way. As much as I want to, as much as I hope to, I know that I'm going to mess up. And I love knowing that James is saying, listen, you may wander from the truth or someone, someone among you, one of your friends, one of your peers, someone in church, they may wander away. But he says, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover and will cover a multitude of sins. This is good news. And I'm so grateful for this. James has been such a eye-opening book to read, really. Every every verse, I mean, all of God's word is really just so inspired. But every single verse, every, every single thing that I have read over these last five days has been so actionable and applicable to so many different areas of life. And so I really encourage you to take some time to go back through and read the entire book, right? Like, I think I read the entire book in one sitting, honestly, and then I just kind of went back through and deep dove through each chapter but I would love to know what did you get from this right what did you get from reading James chapter 5 did you agree with what I was saying about your prayers of faith do you you know what are your thoughts around what James is trying to communicate to us and what have you learned about who God is right like every time I read scripture I just realize God is merciful God is so compassionate he is so loving right is he is he a jealous God yes but his jealousy is because he yearns for us it's because he wants us to be safe right he just wants us to be safe in the fold that he created for us and i'm grateful for that like it's so nice to know that i have a loving father i am excited to see what you got from james i really enjoyed doing this series with you let me know your thoughts and i will see you in the next one